One of the most cryptic features of the Great Pyramid are the so-called air shafts. The two major theories say that they're meant for either ventilation or to guide the pharaoh's soul towards certain stars. This video will present another theory. We'll first cover the history of the shaft's exploration. Then we'll present arguments against the two major theories, ventilation and star alignment. Finally, we'll propose a new theory. As always, we colorize and enhance old photos and illustrations. If you want to see more videos, please like and subscribe. The Great Pyramid shafts are four narrow conduits that stretch out and upward from both the king's and queen's chambers. The ones in the king's chamber reach the surface. Here's how they look like outside. These inclined stones are likely 19th century restoration. In the northern shaft, the debris was unclogged and airflow improved in the 1990s, during the first robotic exploration. This photo from that time shows how dangerous it may be to be on the side of the pyramid. By the way, one estimate says 1,600 people have died climbing the pyramids in the last 200 years. The shafts in the queen's chamber don't reach the surface their ends are capped with blocking stones. In the time of ancient Greece and Rome, the upper chambers in the Great Pyramid seem to have been unknown to visitors. The first recorded entry into this area was by the Caliph al-Mamun in the 9th century. Though we can't be 100% sure if he really dug the tunnel of his name or if he just uncovered an older robber's tunnel. His men found nothing of value and an already lidless sarcophagus, even though it originally had a lid with locking pins. The upper chambers had likely been looted long before then, possibly already in ancient Egypt. The first mention of the king's chamber shafts is from the 12th century, by the Arab traveler al-Baghdadi, who reports the observations of others. The first direct observation put in writing is from 1610, by the English traveler George Sandys. The queen's chamber shafts were discovered by the Scottish engineer Wayneman Dixon in 1872. They were hidden behind a five-inch thick cover of seemingly untouched stone, in the shafts, Dixon discovered a few objects, sealed inside since the pyramid's construction. A small granite ball, a double hook tool made of copper or bronze, and a cedar rod, likely the tool's handle. In the early 1900s, the Edgar brothers probed the shafts with extendable steel rods capped with wooden bulbs. Several of these rods still remain in the shafts. The sparse, isolated scratches on the walls were likely made at that time. In modern times, the shafts were explored by robots three times. In 1993 by Rudolf Gantenbrink's Upuout robot, which discovered the blocking stones. In 2002 by iRobot's Pyramid Rover, which drilled a hole in the terminating stone. And in 2010 by the Jetty robot, which peeked into a small space behind the blocking stone. On the northern side, the shafts change directions in peculiar ways. Here's a 3D view from above the king's chamber. Both shafts veer to the west or left, as if trying to avoid something. It doesn't seem to be the Grand Gallery, as the shafts would clear it if they just continued straight on. Maybe what they avoid is the empty space detected in the 2016 Muon scans. These turns are offset in elevation. It may suggest that the void is at an angle like the Grand Gallery, rather than horizontal. In fact, there's enough room there for a second Grand Gallery. Curiously, these avoiding turns are much lower than the location of the proposed void. If these turns are there to bypass the void, they wouldn't have to be this low. The bypass space is offset sideways from the gallery, which appears to match the scans. This could argue against the proposal of the voids being a relieving space for the grand gallery, as it then would be located above the gallery, not to the side. These odd turns raise another question. If you want to avoid something here, why have the shafts turn at all as they approach the chambers, instead of just having them follow the shortest possible straight path? We'll propose an answer later. Here are the counter-arguments to the shaft's function being ventilation. 1. Why not make the shafts horizontal, for a far more efficient airflow and vastly simpler construction? 2. The portcullis, plug blocks, and hidden prism stone tell us that after the funeral, no living person was meant to enter the chamber again. So who's the fresh air for? 3. No other pyramid has ventilation shafts, even though some chambers are under a bigger volume of stone than Khufu's chamber. 
Why the need for ventilation in Khufu's case? 4. Mummies don't need fresh air. Bodies buried in the desert sand often mummify naturally without airflow, and the Dar al-Bahari mummy cache shows that mummies in a closed space do just fine. 5. Warm, breathed-out air and smoke rise. Ventilation would be more efficient if the openings were at the top of the chamber, not near the floor. The following counter-arguments apply to any theory involving an opening to the outside, including ventilation. For as long as we have written reports, the open shafts had to be cleaned of debris, roughly every century or less. If there's no maintenance on open shafts, the desert will shut down any function, physical or spiritual, within decades. When not clogged up, any opening is a magnet for bats and insects. Al-Baghdadi in the 12th century reports bats as big as pigeons. In the 19th century, Colonel Kutel reports almost a foot of bat guano mixed with insect dust. At Khufu's time, Egyptians already knew from Snefru's pyramids that any opening to the outside quickly leads to infestation. Why build the grandest pyramid ever, knowing the pharaoh's sepulcher is probably ankle-deep in bat dung? Last but not least, when time passes and the pyramid's no longer guarded, any opening is an obvious pointer to grave robbers where to dig. Exhibit A. The robber's tunnel partially dug into the northern shaft's end. The second major theory says that the shaft's goal was to direct the pharaoh's soul towards some stars, so that the soul can enter a celestial realm. All arguments against outside openings apply here. What follows are just arguments against star alignments in particular. This theory is linked to modern names, but the basic idea of a pyramid feature aiming at a star was proposed in 1880. Before we proceed, here are the basic Egyptian beliefs related to a burial. Instead of a single soul, like in the West, the Egyptians had several entities. The ones relevant here are Ba, your unique personality, and Ka, your life force. After death and proper rites, the Ka and the Ba merge into a spirit which can move around and influence the world. When the star shaft theory comes up, invariably the Unis pyramid texts are cited to support it except the Unas pyramid itself has no star shafts. If a pyramid whose texts supposedly support star shafts doesn't have them, the theory doesn't quite add up. Only Khufu's pyramid has such shafts. If this theory were true, no other pharaoh would have made it to the stars. Khufu's sarcophagus had a solid lid, locked with metal pins. To get anywhere at all, the soul had to pass through this lid, a physical object. If the soul can pass through objects, why dig a path for it through the pyramid? The spirit world in ancient Egypt was handled with symbolic elements, like false doors, symbolic offering tables, etc. The Egyptians obviously saw that the offered food wasn't literally eaten by a spirit. The act was symbolic. The Egyptians even may have used models of food, not real food. There's no reason why Khufu's soul would be accommodated using anything other than symbolism. Let's see how star shafts fit the major theories about the three chambers in Khufu's pyramid. The first one is the reserve chambers plan. Each lower chamber served as a backup, in case the next higher, technologically more challenging one, failed to be completed. This explains why the work on the queen's chamber shafts stopped when the king's chamber reached its final level. Note, whether the bedrock chamber had existed before the pyramid is immaterial. Here, the key point is that it was always treated as either a decoy for robbers or a backup chamber, never as a first choice for burial. The reserve chamber plan raises an obvious question. If the queen's chamber was a backup for the king's chamber, why don't its shafts have the exact same angles as the king's chambers? Wouldn't the pharaoh's soul need to go to the same stars, regardless of which chamber prevailed? Another theory proposes that the queen's chamber was a serdab, or a dwelling for the pharaoh's ka, it too raises an obvious question. If the pharaoh's ka is housed in the queen's chamber, shouldn't there be an internal shaft linking the two chambers? It seems far easier to connect the queen's and king's chambers directly and save yourself two external shafts, given that both designs achieve the same thing. The modern star shaft theory was published in the 1960s when it was hard for non-astronomers to check such claims. Today, it can be done with popular software. Note. We're only dealing with the star shafts within the conventional dating here, not the Orion versus Giza plateau theory, nor attempts to date the pyramids to much earlier times. As most people know, the stars in the night sky rotate around the celestial pole. Currently, Polaris is the closest star to this point, but this point wanders in a circle over thousands of years. In a given era, the celestial pole is the only location you can unambiguously point to in the sky. 
all other star locations are ambiguous because of two reasons. One, you have to pick some specific point on the star's circular path. Typically, it's the highest altitude. Two, often there are several stars on close circular paths. It becomes arbitrary which one of them is the intended target. To point to the celestial pole, a line must be at an angle equal to the geographic latitude. None of the shafts in the Great Pyramid is at this angle. We'll now look out through each shaft in 2560 BC. The cross in the center is the point the shaft aims at. Supposedly, the North King's shaft aims at Thuban or Alpha Draconis. When we set the stars in motion, we see that there are two major stars orbiting in that area, Thuban and Iota Draconis. Which one the shaft supposedly aims at, if any at all, is completely arbitrary. The South King's shaft allegedly aims at Almatak, or the leftmost star of Orion. Except it doesn't. It's actually much closer to the middle star, Alnilam. Incidentally, this is also at odds with the Orion versus Giza plateau theory. In it, the Great Pyramid supposedly corresponds to the leftmost star. It seems odd that the Great Pyramid's shaft aimed at Orion points to the middle star. The bigger issue is that along with the middle star of Orion, the King's South shaft also points at other stars, depending on time. How does the Pharaoh's soul know which star is supposed to be its destination? You may say that Orion was culturally significant in Egypt, so the soul would recognize it. But if the soul already knows the culturally significant stars, why the need to point it to any stars at all? The Queen's northern shaft allegedly looks at Kokab, or Beta Ursi Minoris. But it has the same star ambiguity problem. This shaft also has the biggest disparity in the claimed angle by different researchers. The Queen's southern shaft is said to point to Sirius. But in addition to Sirius, you get nine other ambiguous stars to choose from. Plus, whichever angle discrepancy between researchers you prefer. As we've just seen, the proposed star alignments are ambiguous and inaccurate. They depend on which angles you deduce from the shafts, and which stars you deem important among several on similar paths. Hollywood and accuracy don't usually go together. But the 1955 movie Land of the Pharaohs gets one thing right, an aspect completely absent from both mainstream and alternative archaeology, namely the secrecy of the design and site security. What is that stone, Father? That's the sarcophagus of the Pharaoh. Where does it go to? Into a great chamber in the pyramid, but where that is you must not know. I understand that you're ready to start work on the inner labyrinth, the secret part of my tomb. That is true, my lord. I've given considerable thought as to the method of doing this work so that the secret will remain ours. Yes, my lord. These men are your assistants. They are priests. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. Their tongues have been cut out so that even in their sleep they will not betray the secret. I have not gone as far as this, done what I have done to risk betrayal by any man, not even my own flesh and blood. The men who do the actual labor, they will be blindfolded and led into the pyramid by these men. On their way out, their eyes will again be covered so that they will not know where they have been or in what part of the pyramid they have worked. No man must loosen his blindfold. The penalty for knowing the way to the inner chamber is death. Why are we stopping? Never mind. Slip your blindfold a minute, center, and go carefully. This is a further test to determine if the workers can see. They think of everything, don't they? In the minute traps like this, you'll need to remember them. The blindfolds, mute priests, and deadly traps may be over the top, as they'd just impede work. But Khufu's paranoia about keeping the pyramid's design secret seems correct. To explain Khufu's big idea, we need a visual recap of pyramid's development until then. All prior tombs and pyramids had burial chambers underground. That's what the whole population of Egypt, including grave robbers, expected when the Great Pyramid was built. Khufu's idea was to secretly place the burial chamber high up while retaining the expected underground chamber pattern to fool the robbers. Khufu wanted to keep this secret from the population and as many workers as possible. The West Car Papyrus describes Khufu's interest in the secret chambers in the Temple of Thoth. Maybe it's just a legend. Maybe it reflects Khufu's real love of secret chambers and the like. Keeping secrets on a huge construction project is very hard. What the Pharaoh can do is divide the workforce into groups on a need-to-know basis. All the lifting crews on the sides of the pyramid, shown in our previous video, could be banned from the top platform, so they can't gain knowledge of the layout of the chambers. 
only more trusted workers would be allowed on the top platform. This workforce separation could also apply off the pyramid, in their barracks, etc. On the platform, the secrecy could be taken even further, with tall obstacles blocking the view of the chambers from the workers merely distributing the incoming stones. Elevated points on the plateau, like Gebel el Kibli, were probably guarded to prevent civilians from seeing the platform. Everyone would obviously see huge granite slabs brought in at the start of the construction, as proposed in the previous video. But once the platform rose a few courses, outsiders couldn't see what's done with these slabs. On this channel, we lean towards the casing of the pyramid being a separate operation. This fits well with the security mindset. Had the casing been laid along with the core, the casing crew would be both on the pyramid sides and the top platform, across the need-to-know workforce division. If casing is a separate operation, the casing crew is on a structure with its interior already hidden. With secrecy as a goal, the shaft's function is easier to grasp. Let's use the metaphor of the pyramid as a bank and the burial chamber as a vault. What crucial thing is missing here? A security system. And that's what the shafts were. Khufu likely surmised that many of past pyramid robberies were inside jobs, and that his innovative plan to place the chambers high up hinges on secrecy. The shaft's goal was to help catch all those snooping around the chambers without permission, possibly planning a future robbery. The second goal was to help guard the sarcophagus, any statues or oversized grave goods put in the chamber during its construction. The shaft's existence was itself kept secret possibly even to the point of separate security teams constructing and handling each shaft, which could explain why the shafts run at different angles. There are two ways to use the shafts, manned and unmanned. Manned approach means guards in the internal chamber, near the shaft, and a security post on the platform, in a tent hiding the exit of the shafts. There may have been two security posts for the north and south halves of the platform, Besides operating the shafts, the security posts would also keep the lifting crews off the platform, watch out for anyone making sketches, etc. How many guards in a chamber? It depends on the reason for having two shafts per chamber. One reason could be just backup, in case the other one gets clogged up. Another reason could be mistrust. If we post a single guard, he himself may be tempted to get involved in a robbery. If we post two guards from different units and rotate them every day, it minimizes the chance of them conspiring together. Dixon's discovery of the Queen's chamber shafts in 1872 was soon followed by suggestions of the shaft's possible use for acoustic communication, by either speaking loudly into the shafts, or banging some object against one end of the shaft. But this is bad for security. At any time, anyone can eavesdrop without the guard's knowledge, and learn about the chamber's layout and the shaft's function. Signaling is safer if it excludes everyone but the recipient. Downstream, the fastest way to signal would be to simply roll a stone ball down the shaft. Painted marks on the ball, or the ball count, would signify standard messages like these. Another way to signal, both up and downstream, are ropes fixed to a visual indicator, like wooden arms, akin to a simple semaphore. It would indicate standard messages like these. Thus alarms could be raised without alerting the workers. Incidentally, semaphores for military communication were known in ancient Greece. Unmanned methods are possible, but they're unreliable and more fickle. For example, seal the entrance to the king's chamber with a tightly fit removable door. Place a burning oil lamp at the shaft's exit within the security tent. The oil lamp will flicker if anyone breaches the chamber. This method has obvious disadvantages listed here. Here's a possible construction and use timeline of the king's chamber shafts. The shafts in the chosen granite blocks were carved by vetted masons, under security supervision, leaving a 5-inch cover. Possibly some filler material was placed behind the cover to prevent sounding different. Regular masons finished dressing the chamber inside, unaware of the shafts. Once the interior was done, the covers were knocked out, guards posted, and the shafts' use began. It may have continued even after the pyramid's core has been built. The shafts' exits may have been masked with small dummy structures. This lasted until the casing stones reached this level, finally covering the exit holes. Were the Queen's chamber's shafts ever used? It's unclear. Dixon says he saw no joints in the cover he broke through. If this is actually true, the Queen's shafts were never used for security. The five-inch cover was left in place during the King's chamber construction. It would have only been opened had the King's chamber's construction failed. 
The granite plug blocks on the wooden ramp at the bottom of the Grand Gallery could have been placed so as to make it impossible for anyone to enter the Queen's Chamber, averting the need to supervise it. Once the relieving spaces above the King's Chamber were completed, and the Chamber was a success, the Queen's Chamber's shafts were terminated with stopper doors. The security system theory presented here answers many questions not answered by other theories. What are the Dixon relics? The tools of communication. As the Queen's chamber shafts don't seem to have been used, these items either fell in by accident or were left during construction. The function of the hook tool is right on the British Museum's label. It's for handling ropes, used by the guards to reach inside the shafts to untangle ropes, etc. Similar tools are used by sailors today for similar tasks. Why do the shafts make left turns near the chambers rather than just continue on a straight path? To avoid damage to the sarcophagus, statues, or whatever large-scale grave goods were placed in this area during construction, the rolling balls used for communication were probably caught in baskets under the opening, but sometimes a ball can build up speed, so the openings were kept away from anything valuable. Why are the shafts built with gentle curves, not right angles, so the rolling balls don't get stuck and the ropes don't wear against the corners? Why do the shafts level off as they approach the chambers? to slow down the rolling balls at the end of their run. Why are the holes at the height of three feet? Because that's where human hands are when working with ropes. Note, today in the Queen's Chamber the holes are higher because limestone pavement about one cubit thick is missing. Otherwise the holes in both chambers would be at the same height. It's a bit like operating the pneumatic post from the early 20th century, its tubes roughly where the hands are. Why conceal the shafts? so the regular workers can dress the interior walls without knowing about the shafts. The shaft's use began only afterwards. Are the parallel smudges on the walls from the rolling balls and ropes being pulled? It's unclear. They're in the Queen's chamber shafts, which, as it seems right now, weren't used, except maybe for short testing. There's a possibility they were used, despite the 1872 discovery, but we'll leave it out for now. The Edgar brothers probe the shafts with steel rods, so it's hard to tell which marks are modern and which ones are ancient. Finally, what about the stopper doors at the ends of the Queen's chamber shafts? If this theory's right, there's nothing of interest behind them besides core masonry. If we ever find anything near the doors, it will be the kind of stuff you'd see in a guard shack. Notes on who was seen entering the pyramid, the name of the security unit, etc. Every security system deployed in a pyramid will fail due to an inherent imbalance. A pharaoh has only a limited time, his life, to build a pyramid. Building huge security features like plug blocks or portcullises is very costly. On the other hand, robbers have unlimited time. Once the pharaoh dies, time passes, and his pyramid is no longer guarded, robbers can do their work, day in, day out, forever. Khufu's pyramid was still built when piling on more and more stones and guarding secrets seemed like it can solve the grave robbing problem. Today, in hindsight, we know it can't. It was probably only during Menkora's reign that pharaohs finally realized the futility of making the pyramids bigger, their interiors more complicated, and hoping to keep their design secret. The presented theory fits the mentality still present at Khufu's time. This theory may be wrong, but it seems to have more answers to questions about the mysterious pyramid shafts than others.